ado, since our speaker is here, we're really delighted that the kickoff meeting this fall for the summit uh, welcomes Rob Astorino, our county executive, to talk to us about those things that are happening in the county that will affect this area in particular. Mr. Astorino? You're still to come up here just yeah. where you get the breakfast? That's right. Oh, okay. You'll get served there. Okay. Good morning, and thank you okay. very much That's for... Uh, for having me here today. I apologize for being late. We, uh, boy, we hit traffic on Route 1. <laughs> yes. So it was uh, a little late getting here. Hi, Josh. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the things that have been happening really since January 1 when I uh, got elected and to then really answer any questions that you might have. But let's, um, let's go back for a little bit on where we were, okay, when we came into office. And it's sort of it, sort of it, uh, do you know Elizabeth Kubler Ross? Okay, so the stages of dying, right? There are five stages of death and dying. First one, of course, is um, denial. No, no, it's not denial. No, it's first one is it's denial. Yeah. So we come into office, right? And we were basically told it's about a sixty million dollar deficit that you're going to inherit. So we looked it up. We had the new finance and budget team look everything up, and we were told now it was a $166 million deficit for next year, for 2011. We came in, they balanced the budget, but we have some big holes that we need to fill for 2011. So we are now in the process of dealing with a budget. Uh, the second one becomes anger. Now we start meeting with groups of people and commissioners. We've got a $166 million deficit. We've got to start whittling this down because we have to have a balanced budget submitted in November to the Board of Legislators. So now it's the anger. You can't cut me. Don't reduce anything, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we get into the bargaining stage. Now the interesting thing about the anger stage, though, is before I go off that, is every conversation was sort of the same. We have a group come in, or a commissioner, and it's, I understand, we have a very big deficit, we cannot raise taxes anymore. I can't afford to live here. And then it's like that little countdown in my head. I know it's like setting a watch. The but is coming. But not us. And so we've got to shift, and we've been doing this, shifting the conversation from me to we. And that's really what we have to do. So it goes from that stage, it goes to the bargaining stage. Look, is there anything we can do about this? You know. Maybe next year we can dig a little cut, but not this year. Can't do that. We've got to get to $166 million. We've got to climb out of this hole. And you don't get from there to there with little steps. Now, this is massive. To put it in, in context, because, you know, all numbers get thrown out these days. I mean, we've gone from the millions mean absolutely nothing, I guess, right, to the billions, to the trillions, and it's all gobbledygook. But it's real money. And when you talk about Westchester, our budget is $1.8 billion, approaching $2 billion budget for the county. But that $166 million deficit, you can't put it in the context of the $1.8 billion, because that's all the money we get, including money from the state government, the federal government. We've got to put that in the context of really what we collect in taxes, and that's over $500 million. So a $166 million hole out of 530 that we collect in property taxes, that's big. That's 30%. So there's nothing fun about what we've been doing since January 1st. So we get from the bargaining stage, uh, and then it gets into the depression. You know, everyone realizes what we're dealing with now. And it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pretty. The things that we've had to do, some of it, of course, is not popular. But in order for us to fix this problem, not just for this year, next year. This is long term. We're talking structural changes that need to be made, just like they're trying to do in Albany or they're trying to do in Washington or we're trying to do on local levels. There are structural changes that need to be made to save not a budget line, not a particular program, the system. Because let me tell you, the system is collapsing. We can talk about pensions, which are a huge huge issue on every level of government. Uh, these are things that aren't going away. They're getting worse. And in order to pay the bill that is handed to us by Albany, 
we have got to make some big structural changes. So there's going to be a lot of pain. Uh, and then, of course, it's acceptance. You know, okay, we realize how bad it is. How can we help? So that's really what we've been dealing with since January 1st. Um, my wife and I very rarely these days, we have a seven-year-old son, a five-year-old daughter, and a, a, almost a one-year-old daughter. She's just getting ready to walk. And rarely these days do we stay up for midnight on January 1st. You know, the days of watching Dick Clark are over. We, we <laughs> can't make it up anymore. But this year, you know, this previous year was kind of special because I had just gotten elected and once the ball dropped and Dick Clark said Happy New Year, it was, <laughs> it's your mess now, Astorino. <laughs> so we, we stayed up and it was exciting and um, the next day I get my first official text at 8.20 in the morning on January 1st. Congratulations, Mr. Astorino. Why are my taxes still so high? <laughs> that's true, and that's really what we've been dealing with. So we realize as the highest tax county in America two years in a row that that is a label that we must shed. And in order for us to do that, we've got to make some very difficult choices. As I said a few minutes ago, this is not fun. If anyone thinks that I sit up in the office and, you know, like Mr. Burns on um, The Simpsons, <laughs> None of this is fun, whether it's scaling back daycare, whether it's uh, changing transportation routes. But again, in order to save a system that is falling apart on all levels, we have got to make some very difficult and critical choices that are going to get us past not just this year, but sort of set us on the path for the next several years and in a long time. Because this economy is not getting better anytime soon. Uh, it is sort of stable. But when I've talked to a lot of business leaders and bankers and others, and they are absolutely petrified because there's another shoe that could drop in the mortgage industry. And money is still tight. Credit is not out there. And people are just hanging in. And if they're just hanging on in their businesses, then so too are the employees. And so everything again could come down like a house of cards. And we have got to be in a position that if it does fall down again, um, where they are standing. So it's sort of like so we just unfortunately had the ninth anniversary, if that's what we're calling it, uh, of September 11th. And we, we live in two different worlds now. We live in September 10th and before 2011, uh, 2001, and now September 12th on from 2001. The whole world changed. We adapted. We had to adapt. The country was under attack, and we had to rethink everything we did with security and the way we live. Whether we liked it or not, we had to make changes, and we did. And I think most people would say we're probably safer today than we were. We can disagree on certain things, but we're probably safer today than we were. It's the same from 2008 before and 2008 beyond. The world changed financially. Everything collapsed. The world changed. And we have to reinvent ourselves and the way we do business here as well uh, because it's going to impact everything we do. We, we may not be able to fund programs the same level and we have to think about whether or not everything we're doing is still valid today. Now, a program that was instituted 30 years ago, does it still have validity today at the levels it's being funded or just in its mission? But everything that we're doing is trying to look at core government, core services that we're supposed to provide. And so when I spoke January, 4, January 5th was my first department head meeting. I met with all the commissioners, and I basically said, look, this is going to be a rocky ride, folks. You're going to be asked to do things and to reinvent your departments, probably like you've never been pushed before. But we have to do it. And if, if it's not something you, you know, you're bargained for, or signed up for, then now would be a good time to leave because it's going to be strap in and, and get ready for a rough ride. And to their credit, they came back <laughs> several times and they were told not enough several times and they had to go back and they had to rethink what they were doing. So it's been a, uh, an interesting 10 months so far. Uh, the budget obviously has consumed many of us, uh, not just you know the county executive's office but the board. And a budget will be submitted in November. It will be balanced by law. 
And as I said and as I ran on, the days of taxing our way out of this has got to end because that's why we're in the situation we're in. And that requires making some very difficult choices because the easiest way is to keep things the way they are and just keep taxing and asking for more uh, to, to perpetuate it. But we've passed that line. And so we will submit a balanced budget and we will submit a budget that has a 0% tax increase. Now, that 166 was taken down by about 50 million because of mid-year savings that we had to institute. Again, believe me, some of them not popular at all, but they had to be done because the surpluses that we've had to work with are very low. They were built up over the years for a purpose to be used when they needed, and they used them. But now there's really not a lot to go back to. And I don't want to do gimmicks. I don't want to do one-shots. That's not what this budget should be about. So we've got to make some structural changes. Uh, so we, we save about $50 million in some of the things that we've done. We've anticipated about another $40 million that we can save or expect to save in health care costs, et cetera. And we also made some changes with the board that Westchester was only one of four counties in the entire state that requires no health care contributions from its employees. Now, when I say no health care contributions by its employees, it means that everyone in this room is paying 100% of the tab for someone else's health insurance. I don't think that that's the way we should be doing business anymore. It's not, you know, it's not feasible anymore to pay those kind of costs at the level they're rising each year. Our pension costs are expected to go up almost 40% in the next three years. That's not sustainable as it is. It's just not sustainable. That's not even talking about programs or cuts anywhere else. That's a, sh a pure bill we get. Our health care costs are about $125 million a year. That, too, at 10% increases a year is not sustainable. So what we did is we, for the first time ever, non-union employees, because these are the only ones we could deal with right now because we're in contract <laughs> negotiations with our six unions, non-union employees for the first time ever are contributing to their health care costs, including myself. 10 to 20 percent based on their salary. We've also capped and reduced the limits in the number of vacation days and sick days that they can cash out when they leave, and it is exorbitant. I mean, I don't know how many people here can cash out 125 sick days when you leave. <laughs> can you even carry over five to the next year? Well, that's the deals that they've gotten through the years. Now, I don't necessarily blame the unions. They're going to ask for the for the sky, but they were given the sky. And we've got to start bringing this down to reality. So those are some of the things that we've been uh, dealing with, reducing. But now we're in contract negotiations with the unions. Now, and I've said to them, you could either continue to get what you've been getting. They have a 4% increase this year, a 4% increase next year. Or you can come back to the table. You don't have to. The CSCA, they're in their fifth year or their sixth year contract. But I would like for you to sit down be part of the solution, and we can try to avoid layoffs. Uh, I don't see a scenario where layoffs are not part of figuring out this deficit. We have voluntarily, through a county incentive program and opting into the state retirement, reduced the workload uh, workforce by 463 people, about 9% of the workforce. That's a good start. That, they went out the way they wanted to go out. They retired. They managed their own careers. But we are not at the level that we need to be at in order to get to, to the zero. So uh, again, there really isn't anything fun about some of the things we're going to have to do over the next month or two, but they are necessary. So that's the main thing that we're dealing with. Obviously, there are other issues, but I thought it would be better at this point just to open it up and take some questions before the pancakes come. We are having pancakes, right? I have a question. Yeah. What role, if any, do you see the county government in terms of what everybody agrees? Louder. What role, if any, do you see the county having in terms of the word consolidation? Now, Westchester County has been unfavorably compared to Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, and for years and years and years, everybody's been talking about consolidation. Now, I think um, the ex executive of Nassau County was calling it, <coughs> sorry, uh, um, consolidation without changing the names. I think we call it, um, I forget what, 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 what role do you see at the county in terms of consolidation, which everybody agrees would be 
uh, real structural change. Thank yes. You. Yeah, ha uh, <coughs> consolidation of governments. Yeah, local. Yeah. Very local. Right now, do you know how many taxing jurisdictions there are in Westchester? Exactly. 425 taxing jurisdictions in Westchester County. It's insane. It really and truly is. I fully supported the uh, Attorney General Cuomo's bill that was passed in the, how, in the uh, Assembly and in the Senate and signed by the Governor. That would allow local uh, districts, members and voters in those districts, whether it's a sewer district, a library, water... Functional consolidation. Functional consolidation. Um, I fully support that bill. Uh, which passed, and now would allow people to merge, to abolish uh, these small districts that are taxing districts and autonomous. And I think that's a good step. Uh, I have advocated merging and consolidation for a long time. And one of the things that we've done already is we have a proposal uh, before the Board of Legislators to merge the Department of Public Safety with the Department of Emergency Services. They do similar things. Uh, you know, you've got grant money application that they're all fighting for, and quite frankly, you have equipment sitting getting dust. Uh, there's a chain of command issue at major incidents. So aside from the financial savings that we can combine by having people who are doing the same thing, only one of them doing it instead of two, we have a clear chain of command, and that's very, very important. There are other departments that we're looking at, uh, as is the board. Uh, I also support, um, you know, what we have said is the county is willing to also help the municipalities in consolidation or merging. We have a proposal right now, uh, and this is a very important thing. The county cannot be seen, nor will I, be the big bad county and start marching into villages or towns and saying, yeah, you will do this, we want you to do that. My philosophy, this is a bottom up. The county is here to assist, the county is here to help and the county is here to lead when necessary. But the town of Austining is a perfect example. The town of Austining uh, came to the county. There's the town of Austining, which is outside the village, and they have a 16-member police department at a $3 million a year budget. And the town came to the county and said, you know, we'd like to explore the opportunity to have the county take over the policing in the town of Austining which we already do in the town of Cortland, by the way. I said, sure, we'll, we'll figure out how to make it work. The county taxpayers cannot subsidize it, cannot lose. If the town of Austin taxpayers win, then it makes sense. We would save them $1 million a year. Now, $1 million on a $3 million budget is significant. The town of Austin is deciding what to do, whether to come with the county and have the county pick up their police services or there's a proposal with the village of Austin to consolidate there. I think the conversation's a good one. No matter which way, if the taxpayers win, that's a great thing. So I think uh, these are the conversations that are happening now because they should, uh, because some people were pushing it. And just like, you know, I know there's a lot of consolidation, a lot of shared services here in the, in the, between the town and village of Amaranek and Larchmont. And I think that's progressive. I think that's good. That's really the model that has to happen for the future because just like the pension costs are not sustainable, you know, we all like to have things local and we all like um, our own neighborhood stuff, but we've got to look not so much on the micro level but the macro level because if everyone is agreeing basically that we can't afford the bills anymore at the levels they've been at, uh, then we've got to make the tough choices and some of them are to join together and put the you know, there's an emblem or a sticker uh, or a seal that says one thing on it, but we've got to be willing to take that off and create a new one that we all can win and all get the services. Yes? Um, I'd like to talk about the flip side of the budget picture, revenue. Mm -hmm. um, how can we, uh, how can the county bring in revenue to, um, to besides tax money, yeah. uh, to our communities and as county, official county cheerleader, uh, what are you doing for economic development? And do you know that um, America and Larchmont are a great place for businesses to locate? And how can we <laughs> help you sell us? <laughs> I will be a big cheerleader with you. I just won't wear the skirt, but uh, I'll pom poms. I'm more than happy to go out with you and, and 
you know, talk about Mamaroneck and the, and the whole Sound Shore. The um, economic development is, is really the third prong in our three-prong attack. And it's important because what, what we've heard, quite frankly, from a lot of businesses, small and large, including the corporations, is that the cost of doing business in Westchester and New York is so far and above everywhere else that they've really had to consider whether they should stay here or not. And you could see how easy it is to take a company in Westchester and just move them right down Route 1 into Fairfield County because it's about half the costs of doing business. So if we're going to be competitive on even a regional basis, not even state versus state, where you have North Carolina and Texas and other states with lower, much lower rates for taxes, for corporate taxes, property taxes, no income taxes. Um, we've got some great things about New York and certainly Westchester. Education, our transportation, our proximity to New York City. But we also have some extraordinarily bad negatives in the cost of doing business, the rules and regulations. We, uh, New York is 49 out of 50 in business-friendly states. I mean, these are things we've got to really turn around because if it's easy for someone to go somewhere else and they're being wooed by the governor of Connecticut who comes into Westchester and says, why don't you just come down the road? Your workforce can continue to live where they live, but you'll pay half. These days when you're a CEO and you go to your board of directors and you say, you know what, it doesn't make sense anymore, they're going to say, you're right, pack up and leave. PepsiCo we're fighting to keep in Westchester. Uh, they've got some real strong proposals to go elsewhere, and we've been meeting with them often to stay here. But it's not just the PepsiCo's of the world. It's the Nautilus Diner. It's everyone up Route 1, up and down Route 1, because they're fighting to keep it here. And, you know, I make it a point, really, of everywhere I go around the county to walk in along Main Street to just stop in and say hi to the property owners or to the business owners. What's going on? How's it going? One of the things we hear a lot about is the rules and regulations. Now, I can't affect what happens in New York State, but we can have a better attitude towards business here in Westchester. And so I've met with the Commissioner of Health um, and some of our other commissioners and say, you know what, look, I understand you have a job to do. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm not telling you to break the law or to bend the law. But you can't be sending out people harassing people, harassing businesses. If, you, if there's a violation or you think there's a violation, you know what? Educate first. Tell them, look, this needs to be changed. Change it. We'll be back in 20 days. If it's not done, you're going to get cited. But if it's not health at risk or life at risk, if that bulb is out, I'm not going to write you a $100 fine because the bulb is out. Fix the bulb. I'll be back in 20 days. And you know what? That's as appreciated as some of the big things that we can't change overnight. But if businesses are having problems with regulatory agencies, we've got to make it business friendly first to keep the businesses that are here and then expand. Now on a bigger level, how do we get businesses to come here? You know what? I hate to sound like a broken record, but if it's, if it's too expensive to live here and it's too expensive to do business here, we've got to change that model as well. And this bigger picture is how do we get off that schneid of being the highest property tax county in America. So if we can level the budget, if we could level property taxes or cut them, then people are going to say, you know what, I don't mind doing business here. I want to do business where I work. But if taxes are going to go up 5 10 percent a year, nobody can plan for that or sustain that. But we're working, our economic development office is getting pretty aggressive now in going out and meeting with people the first part, I think the first six months, it was really listening. What do you perceive to be wrong? What is wrong? What do you want to see us do? How can we fix it? And now we're going to start getting into the implementation phase. We love retail. <laughs> yeah, no, I think retail yeah. is a big part of that, of course. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just have two questions for you. One is, what would be the impact if New York State were to pick up the cost of Medicaid? If New York State were to pick up the cost of Medicaid, what would be the impact on Westchester County? And my second question is, what are you doing with the climate change uh, group that works so hard? Okay, first let me talk about Medicaid. Medicaid, there are basically nine mandates that we get 
that eat up about 90% of the budget. And there's a lot of talk all the time about mandate relief, et cetera, et cetera. What the state has been doing is continuing to mandate programs, but since they've got a $9 billion hole, they're cutting aid to those programs to the counties and municipalities, pushing it down, and yet making us continue the program at the exact same level as it is. So what we've said is if you're going to cut aid, then cut the program or pick up the program or give us flexibility in programs. Don't be so inflexible because we could do things differently and still continue the mission of the program, just maybe change it. Medicaid is an enormous problem, uh, and you've got you to have it in two contexts. First off, no one is saying that the poor or people who truly need assistance shouldn't get it. I mean, we're a society that's very compassionate. We've always been in this country. We will continue to do that. I don't think anyone is advocating eliminating programs that are helping people who really and truly need it. But again, getting back to what I said earlier, the system, the system is collapsing. And in order to save the system for those who truly need it, we've got to start making some changes at the, at the peripheral end and scale back for those who might have to pick up some more slack. So Medicaid is such an expense to the county. It is a huge expense. And the more and more people who are eligible for Medicaid, clearly the bigger the pool, the more the expense. Yesterday, and I haven't read the whole proposal yet, but it's something I plan on doing by the end of the week, the lieutenant governor came out with a proposal yesterday that basically the state should be picking up the cost for Medicaid, which they should. The rest of the country, almost every state picks up the full cost with a share with the federal government. In this state, for historical reasons, that has been passed down uh, a, a share between the state and the counties. But we don't have much say in how it gets administered, but we have to <coughs> pay our bill. So it's an enormous problem. Um, as far as the climate change and things like that, look, I, I have said to all of our advisory boards uh, and every board, you know, continue to do what you're doing. I have no problem with it. It gets down to if there's funding that needs to be required for all this, this is what we have to start looking at um, and what our core mission is of county <coughs> government. But we've been putting together, in, in carrying over policies that were in place before and instituting new ones on energy savings, on retrofitting. We're expanding our recyclables uh, at our plant. Yes? What's the, what's the time to uh, well, we're starting that soon. I mean, we're going out to get the equipment, the laser equipment, to actually read three through seven plastics. Um, a household recycling permanent facility is in design right now, so we won't have one or two of them a year. We'll have it year-round where people can, can bring their household recyclables. So, next June. what's that? Next June. next June is the target. Hi, Judy. <laughs> Come in. Um, so we're, we're making progress on all those things. Not, nothing really stops. Some things get scaled back, some things get reevaluated. Nothing really stops. Yes, ma'am. In the 1990s, there were about um, 1,000 families in our shelters and 1,500 individuals. And that's a huge cost to all of us. And through a public private partnership, we've been able to whittle that down. DSS and DCMH have worked really hard to get that figure down, and now we're down to about 300 families and maybe a little bit more than that individuals. I think that's about 1,000 people in the shelters now. With the cuts in the safety net that are going on, as you talked about, um, you mentioned child care subsidies. That's not my business, but I do hear from people that um, the cost of a child care subsidy is about $300 a month versus the cost of a shelter for a family is about 5500 a month. We all old enough to remember stepping over people in the streets, which has really changed with this county effort, mm -hmm. great effort. What happens now with um, your plans to deal with that issue, the rise? Because certainly when a, when a woman, and most of the child care subsidies are to families that are headed by women, as a sole wage earner and has to stop working because she no longer can afford to do that. What's going to happen to that family and to the cost to us when the shelter starts going up again? What we have to look for is, you know, oops, um, whether or not the county should be the sole provider or 
continue to <clears throat> put tax money into programs or if there are alternate sources as well. Uh, in this federal health care bill, there are new subsidies for a lot of different things that we might be doing right now out of our own tax money. And if we could eliminate our tax portion and yet still keep the program, then we should be looking at that very seriously, which we are doing. Uh, let's talk a bit for about the daycare since you brought it up. Obviously, it was not a popular decision. Clearly, some people were angered by it, questioned why I would do it. Uh, I've heard things from, uh, you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a father with three little kids, why would you ever do that to somebody? You know, it's run the gamut of what I've heard and, and uh, to some extent endured. But again, you have to put it into context to what we're doing. Westchester uh, pays far and above what any other county basically does, including New York City, in this particular instance. Uh, we spend far more in subsidies than New York City or other counties, far more. Far more than the poverty level, federal and state. So in order for us, not just the budget this year, but overall, we're going to have to bring it from what we're mandated to do. We have to, we have to start bringing back some of these levels that the county goes way over and above. Uh, that's what I have advocated. We're not eliminating these programs. We're not throwing people out in the street. We are still providing what is necessary. We're still providing what was set up. Uh, but we have to be judicious. There is not, and as great as everything sounds, you know, there are a lot of programs out there that are deserving. Uh, but we've got to make, again, some very difficult choices here because if we continue to do and fund at the levels we have been, we're never going to tackle the budget crisis. We're never going to stabilize taxes. Uh, there is a level that we've supported, uh, but there's also a level on the other end of the scale that the taxpayers have to consider as well. Because from the howls of screams that we hear about the daycare, we also hear a lot of screaming and yelling from seniors who are basically out of their homes these days because they can't afford the taxes. They paid off their mortgage a long time. From property tax owners, families, like mine, by the way, who are just keeping my head above water in this county. Um, but they're saying, I want to help, and we should help. But you know what? you got to consider me, too, because I can't pay the taxes anymore. And what we've seen is an outflow in New York and in Westchester of people who are paying taxes, who are leaving, and the people who are coming in are people who need services. So you've got this total imbalance now. And we've got to figure out what it is we can afford and what we should be doing. But these are, these are levels, again, when you take a look at the $32 million that we're paying, and that includes federal, state, and county money, the $32 million we're paying for daycare subsidies, the average cost is $13,000 per child. Thirteen, we're asking, why is it that much when you consider all in? Why is it that much? That's roughly the tuition for SUNY. These are questions we've got to be asking and, and demand answers for. Now, if we can provide services at a lower cost, that's the goal. That's really the goal. Now, I, quite frankly, I've been sued by the Lord, Board of Legislators for making some mid-year savings in this. 4% out of $32 million. That's the issue that we're dealing with at the Board of Legislators and in the courts. Do I have the right as an executive to make some mid-year savings and cuts, especially in this kind of climate? Or is the budget that's appropriated by the Board of Legislators a minimum budget that you must spend every dime in every line? That's really what we're dealing with here. That when you boil it down, that's the issue. But in order to have flexibility, we've got to look at everything. And I also have, you know, quite frankly, and I've been sort of surprised by this too, I have a lot of people coming up to us and emailing us saying, why are we subsidizing daycare at all? I had to work three jobs. I have my grandmother coming over. I, you know, that's a valid point too. I'm not advocating eliminating daycare at all. But at this point, we needed to cap it because 
this could absolutely explode, just like pensions and everything else, if we take a cap off and let everybody in. Got to have limits on everything. Yes, sir. Can you speak a little bit about the affordable housing settlement? Ah, the affordable housing settlement. As you know, uh, in 2009, we were sued, the county was sued by a, a group, Anti-Discrimination Center in New York, that claimed that Westchester was not uh, living up to what it was supposed to do with affordable housing and the money that we received in community development block grant money from the federal government, that we were not uh, certifying what was supposed to be done on those forms. So they sued the previous county executive, Spano, and the Board of Legislators came to a settlement with the federal government, which requires the county to build 750 units uh, of affordable housing in 31 eligible communities, Mamaronick and Larchmont being part of those 31. We have deadlines to reach. Um, we have to have 100 units basically financed by next year, 50 with building permits. And so I absolutely oppose the settlement because of the terms of the settlement, but it was ratified by the board and signed off by the previous county executive. So it was something that, whether I liked it or not, January 1, from here on in, it's uh, for me to, and the board, to make sure uh, we satisfy the requirements of this settlement. We, last night you approved, right? Mm -hmm. 18, uh, the, basically the first of the 750 was approved or is in the approval process for 18 units in, on Edgar Place in Rye, Rye Porchester border. Let's hear it for Rye. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, a handful of units that have already been <coughs> approved for Yorktown. And we are meeting with uh, developers almost on a daily basis. We're meeting with municipal officials uh, on a frequent basis as well to find and locate properties in those 31 communities that will satisfy this settlement. Uh, I will say you have a very aggressive federal government that wants to see this completed, that is making this the model for the rest of the country. And so uh, we might have some interpretations, different interpretations of what is the language in the settlement, uh, which we might fight out at times between the monitor that was appointed to oversee this, the federal government. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to build 750 units of affordable housing um, within seven years. $51 million was put aside. It's probably, I'm assuming, not going to be enough at all. So uh, we have to get it done. We will get it done. But it is a process, and it's a long process. Yes, ma'am. How large is your Ford squad? Is what? How much money is stolen? I care about all this coming in, but I am sure that money is stolen from Government. I haven't taken any. <laughs> How large is your fraud squad? Well, Medicaid fraud is an interesting thing because Medicaid is such a huge program with, uh, obviously, I mean, nobody can test that there's fraud and waste in Medicaid. You know, the New York Times did a really big expose a couple of years ago, and the numbers were mind-boggling of what they anticipated through their investigation uh, that was fraud in that program. Anything you deal with that is that large clearly is going to have uh, some fraud in it. What we're doing on a local level is we are working with the district attorney's office. There are so-called medical mills that simply pump out bills to the state that I don't know about a dentist that can do, you know, see 70 mouths in one day, but he's billing the state for 70 mouths in one day. So we're trying to crack down on that. There are some, you know, it's, it's really... More so than on our level, it's more on the state level because they admit it, they're, for all intents and purposes, we're administering it on a local level, but it's the requirements are by the state. We have tried to crack down. We have a new system in place called REACH uh, through not only Medicaid, but really our whole DSS program where people, welfare recipients and others, will come in to qualify, but then they recertify through this. It's helping us. Um, streamline and through the information that we get that they submit uh, through all these algorithms that I never pass math through algorithms and all this stuff but the computer figures it out that you know what this is a target area that you should be looking at 
and it identifies potential areas of fraud and abuse. So that's something that we're just kicking in now that I'm interested to see uh, what, we, what spits out of those computers on this kind of information. Yes, sir. You know, uh, this is such an illuminating discussion, and we really appreciate your coming. And I think we're all learning a lot. A lot of people in this room, like you, are very involved in providing these services. Yeah. Yeah, but you started out by saying the system is dying. The system is, is in a terminal condition, potentially, and you're trying to save it. So my question is, can you scale us back to the big picture? Why do we need county government? It's <laughs> so a great essential. Question. We should let it continue. The, Bruce asked the question, why do, we need, why do we even need county government? And you know what? That is a legitimate question. I think on all levels, the county is a creature of the state. The state set up county governments to regionalize things. Uh, the mission, I think, of county governments has changed dramatically over the years to the point where uh, we're doing a lot of things that maybe we shouldn't be doing uh, in the business of things that are really better handled on a local level, or certainly the state should be handling these. But we are what we are. The state's never going to abolish one county and keep the rest. They're either going to abolish all the counties and take over all the functions, or they're going to leave it as is and probably force more mandates on us to do. So it's here. It's going to be here for a long time. But I think what we need to do, though, is to take hold of our own expenses at our own house and scale back to where we should be. And it's not just me, it's not just us. I think it's happening everywhere. Nassau is grappling with a $300 million deficit. Uh, every county is looking at ways to slim down. The state obviously is looking at it. The federal government, you know, they can print money. We can't. I've been looking, believe me, I've been looking in the sub-basement every day to find that printing press, and I can't. So the federal government is, is clearly spending and spending and spending. It has an effect on what's happening. We're feeling it. The states are feeling it. We walked in the door with 5,600 employees, which I thought from the very beginning was way too much. We're down now to about 5,100, which I still think is too big. And we will continue uh, through the years to get down to what I think is a, a much more reasonable number. A lot of hands up. At, at the macro level, I think you mentioned like $1.8 billion, yes. of which $500 million is tax, local tax, over which you have discretion. Mm -hmm. Now, if you show efficiency in the federal and state allocation, and that efficiency savings, should, should that not, not go into your discretionary expense control area? Should, should we get that saving from showing more efficiency in, from the federal and state allocation? Should that not be a credit for you so that we can spend more on local control? Well, the, the revenue portion that we get is from the property taxes, which is the tax levy, sales tax, mortgage tax, and then state and federal aid, and then some, you know, some fees and fines. That really makes up a lot of the, the revenue portion. The, again, what has been happening is we've seen and we've had to make cuts and adjust on our own level because of the changes that we had to take from the state, just in transportation, the B-Line bus system. There's less money in there today, 11 million less than there was two years ago. But you could increase the user fee there, right? Well, we did raise the fares on one particular line, and that was the express line that ran down Central Avenue into New York City. Uh, and that, again, was not without its battles. But, y we, again, we can't... We can't have a year-long argument over one line when we're bleeding everywhere. And so, again, part of it is, do we raise the fares? And, you know, one of the things that came out of the public hearing is those people on that line, uh, who happen to be the most affluent people in the entire system, by the way, they said, we're willing, if you save the line, we're willing to increase the fare from 450 to 750 And we did that. But we still had to cut back. We had to cut back weekend service just to get, just to stay even, really. We're not making money on this. We're just trying to tread water. So if someone's taking something from you, you either have to get it from somewhere else or you have to adjust. We're adjusting. Within hearing, we know that the economic situation that uh, we have at this time. My question is, 
what are the principles, what is your vision of what uh, the role of the county is and uh, how the county will absorb uh, the impact, the social impact of you know, transportation for, for people to get to work, child care, <laughs> for people to get out there and not be you know, recipients of welfare but really actually moving on in their lives. So I would like to hear that part because we heard about the cuts, uh, but what is your vision of uh, should the budget be balanced? What what is the government, the county going to provide? That's the struggle we're dealing with every day right now. Uh, quite frankly, you know, the just talking about that one particular bus line. Obviously, people were affected. Anything that we do, if we change or take away, uh, if we reduce, people are affected. I understand that. Uh, you know, one of the worst days I had since being in office was on March 8th. I didn't sleep well at all that night. The next day, we had a... Happy birthday. That's your birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Today's my birthday. <laughs> I had to, the next day, you know, not only announce what the deficit was, but also I was meeting with 1,000 employees at the county center to tell them how bad it was, to tell them what effects it could have, to tell them there might be layoffs, but that I needed their help. And there was nothing easy about this, because I had people coming up and say, I have a family to feed. I know that. I mean, this is, this, is not, this is the worst part of this job. There's a very human nature to this. And it's not just you know picking up a piece of paper and saying, let's cut, 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 because the cuts do have a meaning. They have people behind them. But again, uh, like getting back to that particular bus route, that was the lowest performing or one of the lowest performing bus routes in our whole system with the most affluent riders in the entire system. Declining ridership, by the way, in that. And so as we look at it, if we're getting cut by the state and we've got to make up the difference, though I didn't want to do it, we had to make some changes there because you know what? The poorest of the poor, the people, someone in Peekskill or Mount Vernon who has no other options but the Beeline bus system to get to work, do we cut there or do we cut and reduce or ask for more from someone who can afford it? It's not going to be easy, but do have other options. There's subways, there's Metro North, there's other buses. That's what we're dealing with every part of the day. So. I understand, believe me I understand, and like I said, there is not an ounce of fun in any of this, but this is the new reality. It's what everyone should be dealing with if they're not, <coughs> and you see states are dealing with it, uh, and there's clashes, there's clearly clashes, but I think there's a very large majority out there, and clearly, uh, you know, just to get down to the politics of it, in a Democratic county, Democrats themselves changed their vote and voted for a Republican in me to make some of these changes. Um, and again, that's the struggle of the taxpayer who can't really afford it anymore and quite frankly is more of the silent majority out there. They're not the ones lining up to protest. They're the ones expecting the changes because they can't afford the full freight anymore. Yes, ma'am. No. Sometimes in the um, midst of hard times, there are opportunities that present themselves to make some fo very forward-looking change um, and fun changes. And I'm talking about the Playland project. <laughs> yes. And I'd love to hear your Thank thoughts you. on the proposals that have come forward, as well as the, the specific proposal Yes. Okay, let's start with Playland. Playland, um, as we get back to the core function of government and what we can afford short term and long term, Playland was designed in 1928 in a very different era. Uh, and Playland, as I look at it, an amusement park, as we're looking at cuts to daycare and others, <laughs> Playland as an amusement park is not a core function of county government, of any government. It's the only amusement park owned and operated in the entire country uh, by a government entity, and that should say something. So 
you know, this past summer, as I just said, my son just turned seven in July, July 17th. Anyone with July 17th birthday? <laughs> <laughs> but one of his greatest days, and, and, and mine too, he, you know, he, we get up to the Dragon Coaster, and there's 48 inches you got to be to ride the Dragon Coaster. And I could see the whole way, I'm like, oh, please let him make it, because this is going to be just not only embarrassing as he's screaming to get him off the line because they're not letting on, but he's going to be extraordinarily disappointed. We get up there, and he must have had milk all week because he just <laughs> made it. So we go on the dragon coaster and I watched his face the entire ride and I still will never forget what he said. He goes, that was awesome. And it was. It was a great moment for both of us. The emotional aspect of Playland is something I feel too because I was born and raised in Westchester and I've been going to Playland for a long time. So I understand the emotional attachment to the amusement park. But what, we, what we've got to sort of separate a little bit is a couple of the facts. The facts are Playland loses a lot of money every year. What do we do to make the amusement park work? How do we make it better? What I've said is, wait a minute, that's the wrong question to ask. What we've got to do is, what do we do with the property, the entire 101 acres? Now, I'd say 101 because what we've done with the Edith Reed sanctuary is we've excluded that. That should not be touched, should never be developed in any way, so we've taken that out of the equation. But the 101 acres that make up basically the amusement park and the parking lot, etc., we want to find out what's out there, what ideas are out there to make the property better, to take the property basically uh, off the burdens of taxpayers, to make it work. Now, that may or may include the amusement park as it is today. It may be scaled down to the kiddie land only or the historical rides. It may be increased. But I don't know what, out, what I, great ideas are out there. So that's really what it is. It's a blank piece of paper. Come on in, folks. You could look at the entire piece of property as is. You could look at taking over the amusement park. You could look at little pieces of the property. Who has been right now to the Tiki Bar and Restaurant at Playland? That is phenomenal. The success over there has been phenomenal. They've got over 200 seats. They're full almost every night. And you've got boaters coming from Long Island docking and going to eat and then going back home. That's what we should be looking at for Playland. Now, the question pops in, I don't want condos. I don't want houses. I don't want an Ikea. You're not going to get that. It's parkland. So the use has to be parkland. And that's really what we're looking at. And I think it's a fair question to go out to the public and say, what do you want to see there? What do you want to see on that property? What could we do to make it better? What could we do to make it year-round? But we also need, and we're working very closely with the city of Rye, to make sure that uh, they have a lot of say in what happens. Because right now it's three months a year. They put up with it. But if it were to expand in any ways, what would they want to see there as well? So we're very mindful of the local attitudes, the local emotions, and the local desires, too. So the, the requests for proposals are due back in February. And maybe we get nothing back. Maybe they're all duds. But maybe there's some great ideas that we should really look at. And I think it's a fair question to ask. So that's really all we're doing. It is not closing. You know, the rumors that we've gotten emails. We got one email after the newspaper reports went out that, you know, we were looking at this. I have a big family function at Playland this Saturday. Is it going to be open? <laughs> Literally. It's not going anywhere. The park itself next year is probably going to be run the same way because clearly this is a long process that requires um, the vision of not just uh, myself and the county executive's office but of the board of legislators and maybe even perhaps the state. So that's, it's a long process, but I think it's important to begin the process. At the end of our the, yeah. What, what is your administration's uh, attitude and plans in regard to immigration and immigrants? Immigration, immigrants. Boy, now we're talking about the issues that aren't county issues, but I will be more than happy to talk to you about that. Um, look, this is a welcoming country. It always has been. Um, we all have people who came from different lands at some point in our lineage. So I think there needs to be a balance between, again, what we as a country or a state or a county can afford and yet still be very welcoming and still, you know, there are services that have to be 
be provided for people who are here. If somebody walks in, I don't care what their status in, is, if they're injured and they walk into the medical center or somewhere, they're going to be treated and they should be treated. Uh, there's a humanitarian aspect to this, uh, but we have quite frankly really again as a nation have failed on this subject that is a subject that Congress and the President won't even discuss for the most part. There have been proposals both by the Bush administration, by the Obama administration. Congress hasn't done much on all, at all on this. Uh, but clearly, again, when you talk about a system, the system is broken. We all know the system is broken, whether we want to talk about it or not. The system is broken. But people are here as well, and we've got to figure out what to do. Uh, I, you know, I speak Spanish, and it's, it's coming very handy. I go into areas um, all over the county where people may not be able to speak English, but they have questions about their own government or questions that they want answered. And, and whether it's in Spanish or English, I'll do my best to answer it. Thanks. Well, you have, yeah. I'm sorry, what was it? What is the position of the county police, county police? on undocumented immigrants? If somebody is detained or arrested and they have a federal, uh, they have a, um, a felony conviction, by federal law they must be reported to ICE and the federal government. Uh, is the county police going out and harassing? No. You're not uh, part of this 287. The what? The no. Uh, the new law that you're permitted State counties, municipalities can deputize. You're talking about the Arizona law? Yeah. No, I'm talking about the Brewster law. No. Okay. Not that I know of. Right. Yes, ma'am. Is this One it? Okay. Yep. 30 years ago. 30 years ago, okay. A study was made of the um, public safety answering fund system that we have in this county. Now that you're talking about amalgamating EMS and the public safety, I would urge you to look into that because instead of having one public safety answer point, as many good communities across the nation have, we had minimally 52, I understand it's now down to 38, 38 too many. <laughs> it's not only ineffective, it's costly. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, the police commissioner and I were talking about that about two weeks ago. That was a subject that was brought up. But um, you know, the 911 system works well as we have it right now, but might need to be enhanced a little bit. Uh, you pay for it on your cell phone. There's a surcharge on each cell phone uh, for 911, emergency 911. Um, see, the member of the police department is here today. I won't ask you your, uh, your opinion on all that. Well, I thank you for the chance to come. Our next meeting is the, what is the date? The third Tuesday, third Tuesday in October. And I'll get a message out there. It wasn't too bad last night. Great. Thank you.